Um, uh, the Hacker's Apprentice is an escape room that I built in my house. Uh, a little bit about me. My name is Mark Baggett. Uh, I do some penetration testing and instant response consulting. I'm an instructor for SANS and the course author for SANS SEC 573, which is automating information with Python. Uh, I've got my GSE. Uh, this last line down here. Um, as an information security community, we are so awesome. I've never actually contributed a single thing to the Metasploit framework, and yet my name appears in the source code seven times because people were kind enough to give me um, some credit for uh, research and things like that that turned into some tools that some other people wrote. So um, we do pretty good as an information security community uh, when it comes to giving credit to other people. So thank you for that. Um, so I want to talk to you about this escape room that I put in my house. It's a little bit of um, home uh, Internet of Things devices and some Python, and we put this thing together. Um, at this point, uh, I put a, about five hours into working on this thing initially, and I've had, uh, well, I, I've had more than five hours of people using it, which was actually really satisfying at this point, um, including teams from the U.S. Army and lots of different people who have come over to our house to go through this different escape room now that it's been put together. So why I did it? Well, first, Ed Scotus is the root of all evil, right? I, I, I go to DerbyCon, and he's got two co um, keynotes where he's talking about this, these amazing things he's doing in his office, right? Uh, wrote a Build Your Own Jarvis, and then... Um, uh, honey, please don't burn down my office where he's talking about all these cool integrations that um, he's done in his office. And I, I'm, I'm sitting in those, um, those talks just thinking, you know, I, sh I should really be spending some time and doing this. He's, he's talking about the Python integration. All these things. It sounds like a lot of fun. So I go home and I start reading about how to get into this, this uh, home automation stuff. And I come across this project called Home Assistant, which we're going to talk about a good bit today. And as I'm reading through this, I, I'm getting really excited about this project and thinking of all the things that I'd like to do. And about that time, my wife comes up to me and she says, hey, why don't you put down whatever it is that you're working on? Because we're going to have some people from church over on Friday night. This was a Wednesday. She said, S and I, I want you to put together a game or something before Friday night. And I'm like, OK, I can do that. But I really, really want to play with this home assistant thing. So win, win, let's play with Home Assistant, put together some uh, puzzles and challenges and turn this thing into an escape room in the house. So Home Assistant is an amazingly mature product even though it's only about three years, uh, three years old or so. It's got excellent documentation. Really the core of it is this, this event bus that you've got, right? This event bus is where all of these different components that you have in your house and a component can be something like uh, an IoT light switch or um, a IoT light bulb, um, your sleep number bed, things, things like that, they're all components that have statuses, like they're on, they're off, and they'll report any changes in their status to the event bus, and they all listen to the event bus for commands that are gonna tell them to do something or trigger some service. You've also got services that run and you've got multiple interfaces to this thing. So you've got smartphone interfaces, you've got web interfaces, and all of these different things that um, you can use to interact with the devices that are on your system. By default, when you first run Home Assistant, it goes out and it discovers anything that's on your network that it can control. Um, and it does a really interesting, really good job of finding these different devices out there. There's, there's devices on my home network that I expected it to find, right? So um, my Alexa, Google Siri, things like that, an Apple television, any IP-enabled light bulbs or thermostats or cameras, I, I expected it to find those things. But there were lots of things that the, the home assistant found in its discovery phase that I'm a little just ashamed to say as an information security professional that I, I really didn't even think about the fact that it was going to find these things because it just didn't fall into that IoT box that um, I had in my mind. Things like all of the networking gear that I have on my house. It, it just discovered that and it integrated it into the product. And you're like, well, what good would the networking gear be to home automation? And it's actually, I think one of the things I like most is well, it f finds the networking gear. It can do SNMP queries, things like that. If it can get to the ARP um, cache without any authentication, it will. But if not, you can give it some credentials. And it'll monitor the ARP cache that you have on your network. 
And so it'll find things like, well, which phones are on the network. So when I come into the house, my phone connects to the wireless network, and then my MAC address shows up in the, uh, the network. My home assistant knows that I am home or not home. And here you can see in the smartphone, there's a couple of example icons of this person's home, this um, person's not home. And that can be based simply on the fact that their MAC address is in the home networking equipment. Uh, it found all kinds of network services, like iTunes libraries and things like that that were just running on people's um, machines that were in the house. And it integrates that into the home automation. All the televisions in my house, if you've got any type of um, modern television that you can Google Chromecast to or it's got an IP address on it, it finds it and it integrates it automatically into your home automation systems. It found my Blu-ray players, my DVD players. It found my Harmony remote control, the Logitech Harmony remote control that I use to control those things. And so by extension, it can control everything that the Harmony remote can control can turn. So even devices that aren't IP enabled, I can turn those off and on, adjust the volumes, change channels, things like that on those by going through the Harmony remote control, which is IP enabled. It found my sleep number beds, right? And it knows when we're in bed, right? So I can set up automations that trigger when my wife and I are in bed. It found my security system. So my home security system where I can turn off and turn on my alarms to my house. It found those, and I have to say, I really wasn't thinking about the fact that it was gonna find those. When it finds them all, it configures several web pages, such as the one you see here on a mobile phone, where it provides switches that you can control each of those devices. So if you just wanna start turning things off and on, well, that's just out of the box um, capabilities you're gonna have. But one of the most impressive things about Home Assistant is all the different integrations it does, all the different types of devices and things like that that you can control out of the box with Home Assistant. So just to give you an example of that, let's, I, I pulled up their web page before we came up here just to show you. Um, so if you go into integrations, it's got all of these categories down the side. So you can see things like calendars, cameras, cars, right? So in the cars category, let's see, here's a list of some of the cars that you can integrate into your home um, automation stuff. Let's see, uh, DIY, whatever that is, doorbells, downloading, so you can have it automatically download things or trigger things when things are downloaded. What are some of these other things I picked up? Uh, so here's all the different water heaters that you can integrate in. Um, here's all of the different security alarm systems that it'll integrate in with. Here's all of the different, um, what are these? Oh, ne networking gear that it automatically finds, discovers, and um, some of it's just any type of devices that speak plug and play, it's gonna find those devices on the network. So it's a very, very impressive list of integrations that you've got. You can see the numbers in each of the categories they've got there. Once it finds these, it brings them all in, and it creates these web pages. It's got little icons, so you can turn things off and on. You can see the status of them. So here you can see things like my temperature, the humidity inside of the different rooms, the number of a camera alerts I've had, um, master bedroom occupancy, whether or not I'm in my, uh, in my bed. All of these things are icons that are um, displayed, as well as the traditional things you would expect, like thermostats and so forth. It also keeps really extensive logs. So I can go back over time and see when was I home? When was my wife home? When was my family members home? So it's got all of these different logs. When was my bedroom occupied? When, were my living room, when, when was my living room occupied? It's really, really extensive in its logging. It's got nice graphical um, um, interfaces to it. And all of it's open source, right? So when it discovered my security system, and it configured my security system with a switch on there that I could turn off my security from an, a web page on my network, I was like, oh no, that is not going to do. I'm not gonna have someone come in through my wireless, disable my security, unlock my doors, and come in my house. That seems like a really bad idea, but it's open source. So you've got the code there, and it's very easy to go in and comment out the lines of code that are used to unlock things or remove functionality. And even if you don't know how to code anything, 
This is something that you can do. I find that people who don't know how to write any code are very good at disabling functional code. So that is something that just everybody can do when they bring them into your network. One of the things I really like about Home Assistant is they're focused on not letting things go out to the internet, right? So they want to contain everything in your house. They don't want you to be, have to go out to online web services. They don't want you to have to open up things in your firewall. They want to try and centralize things. Now there's some services out there that in order to control those, you, you have to go to um, online websites to control the devices. They don't let you talk directly to the device even though it's on your local area network. So if you can talk directly to your local area network, Home Assistant is going to let you do that. But if you absolutely must go out to a web page, they provide a cloud-based service where it acts basically like a proxy. You can either use them as a paid service or you can just download the code, run it in, in the Amazon instance that you can control. And then you open up one firewall port directly to your Amazon instance, and it has a very tightly controlled API between the thing that's public and the thing that's internal, where you can see exactly what's going in and out of your network. It has lots of custom components, but it doesn't have things. Let, let's say that you are a collector of weird things, like space ray guns, or IP-enabled cryptography machines, or something like that. It may not detect all of the devices that you have in your house. But the good news is that it's a very simple template for adding new things. So you can add your own custom components. So for example, I got this weird Legrand on cue speaker system in my house. And it didn't detect it, um, and I really wanted it to detect it because then I could turn on all the speakers in different rooms and use it as an intercom system. Um, so I just downloaded their template, and you can see here in about 200 lines of code, I was able to create a custom component. Of those 200 lines of code, probably only about 20 lines of that code are actually things that I had to write. The rest of it was all templated. Um, and then I had this custom component where I could control devices that were unique to my environment. Once you've got all the, com um, the things discovered and all everything automatically configured in this web page, then you can go in and you can start adding new configurations to it. So it's, it's all YAML based. So here you see an example configuration where I'm creating, just creating some switches that I want to have integrated in and use as part of my escape room game. So I've got this automated light, so I'm just going to give it a name. Its initial state is, um, state is on, and I'm going to say that it's associated with this particular icon. And then by just creating these things in a YAML configuration, well, now I've got switches that show up in a web page. At this point, they're just switches that I could click on and toggle things back and forth. There's no actual code that executes or anything that's associated with them. But once you've got the switches, that's like the first step in creating your automations. From that point, you can then enable automations. One of the neatest things I think that Home Assistant did is they have a software emulator that, do, that emulates Philip Hue light bulbs. So every one of those switches that I have in the web page, Alexa thinks is a light bulb in my house. And so because it runs as a Philips Hue emulator, and, and it's not just the switches, it's just everything. My sleep number beds, everything in my house can be published as a light bulb to Alexa or Google or any of the other um, home voice assistant type processes. So I can say, Alexa, turn on the escape game. It sees Philips Hue light bulbs, and then that can turn on one of those switches that's inside of the web page. This requires absolutely no code whatsoever. The only thing I had to do to do this is a little three lines of YAML code to create these switches and then turn on the, light, um, the Philips Hue emulator in the system, and now I can control switches in a web page um, front with my voice and whatever type of uh, voice control system you have in your system. All right, so now I want to put some automation behind this. When I flip a switch, I want something to happen. Well, the way that Home Assistant does this is it does it through automations. You can do automations without any coding. Um, automations are done by a trigger. You can add conditions to a trigger. And then you have some actions. So I know you can't see any of this. So I'm going to zoom into each of the components individually. So this is an example of a trigger. Right? So when the state on my um, occupancy sensor in the downstairs thermostat, 
right? My thermostats have occupancy sensors. They'll try and adjust the temperature. If nobody's in the living room for six hours, then it'll turn down the heat or the air conditioning, try and save some money. And I can get to those sensors through Home Assistant. So if the sensor in my downstairs thermostat goes from un unoccupied to unoccupied, then that's the trigger. I also associate some conditions with it. So, and the other condition is that um, the, the device tracker, which is tracking the MAC addresses of my uh, various systems, in if, the, if it sees that Mark's status is now home, then, uh, and it's also another condition is that the sun is, uh, it's before sunset and it's after sunrise. This is, uh, this is GPS specific, so it's, it's looking at the weather service, your latitude and longitude, so it knows day by day when, whether or not, what time sun up is and what time sun up is down. So, so if it's during the day and I just walked home, then I'm going to call the media extractor, um, play media file, which is gonna go to my television set and it's gonna play this YouTube video on my television. If my television was turned off, it would turn it on. If it was set to another channel or some other input, it's gonna adjust it over to the right input and it's gonna start playing this YouTube video as soon as I walk in the door. So I can do stuff like this through a graphical user interface, right? Oh, or, and I can also run some uh, script that's associated with it, and these scripts can be Python scripts. You can do it through graphical user interface. You can also just do it through a YAML configuration. So here's an example of a YAML configuration to do this. This is uh, automation number one. The name of this is the good night script. So if the binary sensors in my beds see that both my wife and I are in bed, and we look at all the devices, and all of the devices that are associated with our house say that we're home, and it's after nine o'clock, then we'll turn off the lights, and we'll enable the, the security system in the house. So we're in bed, everybody's home, turn on the lights. That's my good night script. This is my great night script. If my wife and I are home, and the kids are not, then turn the lights to 50%, and tell Alexa to play the romance playlist in the bedroom. Yeah. Yeah, so this is not effective, as effective as you might like it to be. Um, yeah, as it turns out, the uh, effectiveness of romantic gesture is inversely proportional to the amount of automation that is used. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, writing poetry, something like that, very romantic but it just moves right down the scale. And having Alexa say, it's time to make Whoopi is just about at the bottom of that scale. <laughs> Little pro tips for you. All the things you learn at Wild West Hackfest, right? All right, so now I've got this switch and I can say, Alexa, turn on the escape game. And what I'm gonna show you, all of this stuff can happen without any coding. Everything that I'm showing you up so far, I haven't written any code yet to do what you're gonna see. Now, before I show you what happens in my house, when I say, Alexa, turn on the escape room, let me give you this caveat. You're building an escape room in your house. There is absolutely no chance that you are gonna convince your friends that you are not a nerd, right? So you, you might as well own it, all right? All right, so this is what happens when I say, Alexa, turn on the escape game. You're gonna see a couple of things happen. You're gonna see these, well, first you're gonna see the, the front door lock, right? Because you gotta escape the house. Next, you're gonna see all these lights in the house turn off, except for this light here, which is gonna turn blue. Then you're going to see the television come on and the video play that introduces the escape game. Okay, and hopefully our audio is good here. We'll see here what happens when I click play. No, no audio. All right, so let's try this again. Let's come here. Eh. Sound, right click sound. Let's see. Ding, 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 ding. All right. Yeah. Sounds. Yeah, it's probably going out HDMI audio. So let's see here. Where's sounds? Intel, speakers. Let's try that. Um. Well, holding the mic over the laptop, it's not coming out the laptop either. It's, go it's going out the HDMI is the problem. Let's see. Okay. 
Ja, ja. Oh, wait. All right, so there it's coming out, the speakers here. Let's, uh, let's do this. Thank you. Oh. And so, you're a nerd, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Alexa, turn on the escape game. Can you hear that? Oh, no. No. coming out. Where's my, let's try this again. Alexa, turn on the escape game. Hmm, all right, let's try it. one more thing here. Yeah, let's, let's try and get it to go out the speaker. Alexa, turn on the escape game. Okay. Welcome, candidate. So, you want to become a hacker? Well, over the next 45 minutes, I will present you with a series of challenges. If you complete them all, then you can become my new hacker apprentice. Your first challenge is to find your first clue. Boom. All right, and then it goes on from there, okay? But uh, I don't want to give away too much because, you know, I'm having you all over next week to, uh, to go through the, all right. <clears throat> So from there, then you can start to begin doing automations, right? Um, my first thing was it does Python scripts. I want to use Python scripts to do my automations. But these were a horrible disappointment. Um, the Python scripts are not a good way to do automations. Perhaps the biggest limitation is you can't use the import command with Python, right? So if it's, if it's not, if it's, if you have to use any module, even built-in modules, well, you just can't do it. Basically, the Python scripts in this thing are only really uh, different ways of doing the same thing you could do in a YAML configuration. So don't waste your time with the Python scripts. But it does have this thing called the app daemon, right? The app daemon is um, a, another project that you download. It is written by the same people that do Home Assistant. And in there, you have full control. You can do anything that you want to in Python and integrate it into Home Assistant. So I need some puzzles, and I need to write some app daemon stuff. So this is what it looks like. All right, here's my escape game challenge. So when I say, Alexa, turn on the escape game, right, this is all the code that's need, uh, needed. I, I initialize myself, and in the initializer here, I say, if the input Boolean, if the switch for the escape game turns from off to on, then call the method self.startGame. So here's the method self.startGame. It logs that the escape game has started, and then it records the time. All right, so it's going to um, record what time you started playing the game. It's then going to turn the switch back off in the UI, and then it's going to go through each of the different switches that I've got configured for all the different challenges and see which ones I want you to do, right? So I can um, create a different switch for all the different puzzles, turn one off, turn one on, um, which, as it turns out, becomes an important thing to do in my house. And so kind of the, uh, the, the way that the game comes together is it'll start out with a video. The video will direct you to go and find things, such as a puzzle or something like that. 
The puzzle will have you uh, solve challenges, which will then eventually lead you to perhaps some ammo boxes with combination locks on there. You have to come up with the combination locks or, or figure out what the combinations are. You open those, you find other pu puzzles. They may have you go and do things to devices in the house that trigger some IoT response and then some other video plays giving you more instructions throughout the game. So here's an example of one of the puzzles in here. So I, I, the theme is the hacker's apprentice, right? So I, I want everybody to come over and do hackerish things throughout the house. So first um, challenge says, excellent job. You show pr promise, my young apprentice. A hacker must be able to control computers using only their voice. Recreate the pattern at the bottom of this clue. Then things will start to look up. To start the challenge, you must say, Alexa, turn on hacking beats. And then it's got some basic Alexa commands down here. So when they say turn on hacking beats, then it plays dual core, hack all the machines, turns on all the speakers in the house, plays dual core, hack all the things throughout the house, which is great for to have everybody from Sunday school um, going, drink all the booze, hack all the things, right? But um, so it'll turn that on, but it also then triggers the monitoring of these light bulbs. And so I've got certain light bulbs that you have to turn off and on in the house. And this is the code that monitors the light bulbs. So what I'll do is I'll grab the state of the light that's in the center, and I'll see if it's on. If it's equal to on, then the center variable will be true. If the state of the top is on, then top will be true. If the state of the right is off, then that will be true. And I'll set, check all the states for all the bulbs, and I'm going to check to see if the one light bulb is set to red. And if all of these things are true, then it exits this loop, right? Then it'll return um, all of these are true. Uh, this function here is called by this while loop here that says while the loops, uh, while the lights are not right, then sleep two seconds. So every two seconds it monitors the light bulbs. When everything's configured correctly, drops out of the while loop and it comes down here and it calls the service, media player, play media, and then it's gonna play the next clue on the Sony television telling them what to do um, from there. At this point, my house looks a lot like this. Oops. Do you want to shop for 14 years? Hmm, I don't understand. So that goes on in my house for about 20 minutes while people are trying to adjust the light bulbs on there. The next challenge I have is, well, hackers have to be masters of deception, right? You, you've got to be able to cause a distraction. So, you know, Ned, the guy in the chair, he's our hacker here. Masters, uh, hackers have to be able to cause distractions. So I've got a, a challenge where I have them uh, go out into the backyard where I've got security cameras around the house. And I, tell, I set all the cameras to a very low sensitivity and then I tell my guests they have to have a dance party in the backyard so that they can set off the motion sensors with the cameras in the backyard. And here's the, the code that looks for this. So I'll record the number of motion sensor camera alerts I have in the backyard. And then while the number that I started with is equal to the current count, right? So I'm going to set the start and the count equal to whatever the count is initially. And then while they stay equal, I'm going to read for more alerts, um, log that it still hasn't changed, sleep two seconds, and it'll just sit there in this loop until I get another camera alert. Once I get another camera alert, it'll say, dancing detected. It'll then announce throughout all the speakers in the house, warning, bad dancing detected. Next clue will play in 60 seconds, and then eventually it'll play another clue somewhere in the house. I had the idea of having this Simon as an anchor game. If you've done escape rooms before, you'll know sometimes you'll, you'll get half of what you need to solve a puzzle in, in a box. And then you realize that, oh, my goal is to collect all of these different pieces so I can solve this big challenge that was in there. So what I thought is I, I found these, uh, these uh, switches, these little um, Bluetooth buttons that you could buy from Flick. And you can run just about any code. You can stick these on your refrigerator. When they push the button, it can um, run any type of Python script that you want um, when you push these buttons. So I thought, oh, I'll integrate these in and do a Simon challenge, right? Where I'll have 
say the green, uh, the green button and the yellow button will be in the first ammo box, and then they'll have to play Simon, and, and Simon's the game where you repeat the light patterns that are going on in the house, and then eventually they'll get to a, a blue flash of the light bulb, and they'll go, but I don't have a blue button. How will I ever solve this? And they'll figure out that they've got to collect all the buttons, so I can use this as a bit of a, um, an anchor challenge to get people to work through this. Um, so one of the problems that I found with this, though, was, well, there's, there's a limit to the range in Bluetooth. And so if people don't try and solve the puzzles, right, in where they're in um, enough proximity to the Bluetooth sensors that are in there, and I, I just haven't been able to get this one at, um, out, but um, so I, I haven't been using this one. Um, so, so then I've got this problem that I've paid uh, $50 for a Bluetooth button that has no actual functionality that I can use. Um, so at the moment, here I've got one of my flick buttons. When I press the button, um, yeah, it, it plays fart noises on my phone um, when I push my Bluetooth button. And so, so for those of you who are judging me, I would like to point out that um, the immaturity of flatulence noises is inversely proportional to the amount of automation that's being used. So um, things like ripping one during this talk, very immature. But if you're using Bluetooth, then it suddenly becomes an actual mature thing to do. Okay. Another one of my puzzles in here, I wanted them to do some actual hacking, right? I wanted, I wanted people to learn something about hacking as they came through here. I've got, I've got a 1980s classic Pac-Man, Josh Rakowski here. Um, a friend of mine um, hooked me up with, with buying this thing. So I've got an actual Pac-Man in, um, in the house, but I didn't want people playing my Pac-Man. I couldn't figure out how to IoT enable my Pac-Man. So I got an HTML5, a Java-based um, implementation of Python, or uh, of Pac-Man. And um, when they're watching the video, I direct them to this web page. And so they go to this web page, and there's this big argument that says, and pass num ghosts equals six. And so when they go to the web page, it tells them you must be an excellent gamer or an amateur hacker to pass this challenge. And how long do you think it would take people to figure out that you've got to change the number of ghosts to something other than six? Okay. This was so disappointing. And I'm not just talking about just the people, um, my friends from church, who I wouldn't have expected to do it, but many of the information security professionals. I think people just get so wrapped up in, I get to play Pac-Man? I love Pac-Man! That they have so much fun with the game that they, uh, either that or it's a, I know I could change the number of ghosts to something other than six, but I can beat it at six. And so this is actually one of the things that takes probably most time um, while people are playing the challenge to go through and beat Pac-Man. But if you change ghosts to uh, something other than six, actually I have the, uh, the, va the point value of the dots is inversely proportional to the number of ghosts. So if you set it to six, you have to play for much longer than if you set it to four. Um, Jeff McJunkin came over, played it. Um, he just intuitively went in and set my number of ghosts to minus 500. Um, which took a while for it to generate 500 ghosts, because it did um, generate, but he only had to eat one dot when, um, when he did it before he, he got the combination on it. So uh, Another thing is hackers are open source intelligence experts. So this was a bright idea I had. Um, how about I just name a button, right? This is simply a YAML configuration. I'm going to have a button that is some password. And that password is going to be something that you have to get from open source intelligence gathering. So you've got to figure out the name of the mascot from my high school and my wife's record-breaking track time from 1988. And once you figure out those two things, then you can say, Alexa, turn on mascot track time, which is going to be the name of this switch. And when they trigger that switch, then some IoT um, video will play, or we move them on to the next puzzle. And this works good. So we got some people that are doing some open source intelligence gathering on me and my wife, um, which maybe wasn't a good idea. I, one downside to this is now I see combinations everywhere in my house, right? So um, the thermostats, right? You see 72 degrees. I see two digits of a combination for someone to enter, right? Either I can communicate a digit 
or I can have them set the thermostat to a specific temperature in order to trigger some IoT connection, right? The, the number on the sleep number beds, the volume on the television. I can change the channel back and forth on the TV from two different channels to try and communicate a combination to a lockbox or something like that. So just about everything that has numbers on it can be used as a combination to trigger once people have solved puzzles to move through the different challenges. Now, I do want to share a couple of lessons learned here. Um, some things that, um, some puzzles that I've had to uh, eliminate or, are, or that I have been suggested should be eliminated just because, well, there are bad things. It's important to remember that this is still your house and you still live there. So, for example, my worst idea ever was to have a puzzle where people had to trigger the occupancy sensors in my beds. Okay, that, just, that one didn't last very long at all. Um, having puzzles where you're going to have people go out and run around in the backyard and get mud all over their shoes and then be in a hurry to come back into the house because they're racing against the clock, it turns out that you can get in trouble for that as well. Um, and really, I didn't think about it until um, you know, people started doing open source intelligence gathering on my wife and I, but probably inviting um, hackers to come over and just do open source intelligence gathering on you is, is not necessarily the brightest um, idea that I've ever had. So um, those are some things that I would recommend. If you're going to try this at home, then I would say don't necessarily do those. So what do you need to get started? Well, really, you don't need anything but Home Assistant. And if you were to go home and download this and start running it now, you'd probably find that you have the ability to do some pretty cool automations, even if you don't have any smart home devices. I mean, it found all of my televisions. If you have a television that you can Google Chromecast to, right, and you have a wireless network that your phone attaches to, then the very first script we talked about, where when you walk home it, or walk into your house, it detects that you're now there. It turns on the television, plays videos, or turns off the television when you leave. Those types of things, you can do that even if you don't have any smart devices. And it really required no code to do that. It's just a, a YAML configuration to get that going. But that said, there is a lot of really cool things you can do with Home Assistant. Most of it doesn't require any code, but some of it does. The, most of the app daemon stuff, that is really doing Python. If, if, you, if you'd like to learn some Python, I know a guy, right? So if you're interested, you can check out SANS 573, Automating Information Security with Python. Building escape rooms and Home Assistant is not covered in the course. We do talk about information security, but we'll, we'll teach you some good Python that you can use and practically uh, learn how to implement this stuff, okay? So go ahead and try and download Home Assistant. Let that network discovery run. You might be surprised at the amount of IoT that you already have in your house. And with that, if you're interested, if you have any questions, source code, you can hit me up on Twitter. Um, I'm happy to share samples of the code with you. Or if you have questions, I've got some time to answer them now. No? OK, thanks. All right. Got a question? Yeah. So the question was, what do I do to secure all the components? Um, yeah, uh, what do you mean by secure components? I don't really understand. So, so that is one of the focuses of, of Home Assistant is that you don't have to open up firewall ports in order to, it, it's containing everything in your house. Right? It, they will run emulated services and things like that on the servers so that you don't have to let things go out to the internet and you can keep things closed down. So firewall ports not being open to the outside world and trying to keep everything isolated um, is what we do. And then good security passwords and things like that. Did that answer your question? Okay. Ah, so the question is, what do I run this home automation software on, and what is it written in? So um, I initially did this on a Raspberry Pi, right? And then um, I moved it off to an old laptop that I've got. So I got a laptop that's running Ubuntu, and Home Assistant has just downloaded that. One of the reasons that I um, used a laptop was 
because I needed to find a way to get some of the Alexa integrations and things like that in it. One of the things that I found is um, many of the triggers you have will trigger a Google text to speech thing. So you can go in and put things, free form text into the web page. And then when you click buttons, um, it will then cause the laptop to say, Alexa, do whatever the code is that's on the web page. So I'm using the laptop's speakers to now say things to the uh, little Ale Amazon dot that's sitting on top of the laptop. So I'm doing it on, a, on an, an old laptop that's running Ubuntu. And it's all written in Python 3. It's all written in, everything is written in, I, I have nothing in anything else other than Python 3. Most, and it's all very similar to the types of code that you saw there. So Python 3 and YAML configurations does everything. Okay. Other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference. The one talk remaining, right? All right.